Hello, hello, testing, hello, hello. Can we start settling down there at the back, please? <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give it another minute for people to start trickling in, and then we'll start at two minutes past one. Thank you. Okay, it's now two minutes past one, and I think I'm going to get started because we have a very, very long lecture to take you all through. Um, I was chatting to the team this morning and, well, over the past few weeks, given the, the talks we've seen this week, uh, it's very difficult for us to explain what we do without getting technical. So just bear with us. We're going to try to take you through um, what we do in the Digital Signal Processing Group. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day four of engineering week plus um, i only found out yesterday what the plus actually meant so <laughs> you're not the only one who ever asked that question um, for those of you who don't know me i'm tyrone van bala i'm the functional manager for the digital signal processing group um, and yeah this is what we do so first of all what do we do in the dsp group well our mission is to deliver leading world-class digital signal and data processing systems to support and enable radio astronomy in Africa and beyond and to contribute to the advancement of the field. Our team has quite a broad and diverse range of competencies, um, all the way from data processing, which includes digital signal processing, as well as science data processing as well. Uh, pipelines, so how do we put these different processing blocks together to form pipelines for DSP for radio astronomy, uh, real-time DSP, I might add, and also near real-time science data processing for the formation of images. And then looking toward the future, um, we're looking at combined pipelines for both DSP and um, science processing. And that all makes sense once you see the rest of the presentation. Um, because of the data rates and the volume of data that our team is meant to process, a large part of what we do is acceleration of algorithms. So our team is quite skilled and competent in acceleration on both GPUs, so graphics uh, processing units, as well as traditional or in radio astronomy, traditional FPGA or field programmable gate array accelerators. Again, because of high data rates, we also quite experienced in high speed data transfer. Most of you know about the 40 gig network that we have on Meerkat. So our team is skilled at building terabit scale data networks and also optimize. Um, sorry, is there a question or maybe if you can mute, please. Um, optimizing off the shelf hardware for high throughput ingest and egress. So we try and get all the performance we can out of your off-the-shelf network cards and other networking equipment. And then also, last but not least, we have hardware and FPGA development. So again, our team is quite skilled in low-level FPGA hardware development, um, and that allows us to look at custom hardware accelerated applications for, for the signal chain. Then there's also some auxiliary and support competencies in our group. So qualification, continuous integration and continuous delivery, as well as operational support for the systems that we build. And then governing all of this is team functional and technical management. So who makes up the DSP group? So I've kind of tried to break it up to show because we do a lot of things. Um, I'm not going to go through names. The faces should be recognizable to most of you. I've tried to be fair and I've chose the least glamorous pictures for everybody. So, 
Um, yeah, so we basically consist of the Meerkat Extension Correlator Development Group. They pulled in the Meerkat Extension Correlator, the Meerkat and Meerkat Extension Pipelines Development Team that does the STP pipelines for Meerkat and Meerkat Extension. We have a newly formed Smart NIC prototype team. They are looking at building custom Smart NICs that you'll hear about at the end. <clears throat> we also have uh, what we call a DSP research group, a group that's focused on doing exploratory or computational DSP research to look at how we can uh, optimize and do better at our signal processing. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Alec. Uh, <laughs> that is the Meerkat correlator support. Uh, most of you have probably interacted with Alec, um, whether you are new or old uh, at Sureo. All right, so now what do we do? So to explain what we do, unfortunately, we need to understand the basics of radio interferometry. So I'm going to give you a very you know, simplified crash course in what it is that we actually do for radio interferometry, and you'll see how that relates to what our team does. So basically, I'm not going to point the picture should be, I, I guess I'll point for the benefit of people that are in the audience. Um, basically, we are observing these celestial bodies in, in outer space, and all of these bodies emit some sort of radio signal, and we've heard about RFI in the beginning of the week and you know, receivers as well. And we've got a dish that basically then receives those signals and the whole point of radio astronomy is to learn about the structure or you know positional structure or, and characteristics of these bodies uh, in outer space. And what the scientists do is they take that data, lots of processing and ultimately turn it into a nice image. Um, so that's basically what we do. We make nice pretty images of the universe that we can't see uh, with our eyes. <clears throat> so as you're probably aware, most of you know about photography and have used cameras before. Uh, if you want nicer, better, cleaner images, you need more resolution. So in photography or optical photography, I guess you need a bigger lens uh, to be able to capture more light, and that's how you get a better image. In radio astronomy, if you want more resolution, there's really two ways that you can achieve this. So one is build the biggest dish that you can, um, and obviously that has been done in uh, various instruments, but it starts to exceed you know, or near the, 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 the edges of what's actually practical and achievable. Um, you know, mechanically and, and otherwise. It's also very expensive to build a single large uh, dish. What you could also do is, you know, build an interferometer, which is basically building, you know, multiple smaller little, let's call them telescopes or dishes, and sort of synthesizing them using signal processing techniques to get them to act as a single large uh, telescope. And the difference between the two cases is in single dish radio telescopes, your resolution is proportional to your diameter of your single dish, Whereas in an interferometer, the resolution is proportional to the length of the baselines, and that's just the distance between the dishes in your array. So uh, interferometry, yeah, this is just a comic in case people wanted to laugh at this point, um, but it kind of just explains, you know, the high level concept of interferometry. So if you space two dogs, two small dogs, by some distance D, they behave as a single big dog. And that's basically radio interferometry. That's all you need to know about it. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated for us. So let's look at a very simple case where we're observing, let's call it a single source or one signal coming from a source. Um, if we have two dishes that are spaced apart, these are the radio waves coming through or uh, representation of them. You can kind of see hopefully from this graphic that it's gonna reach the two dishes at different times. And there's a little bit of a delay between them. So we call that delay tau. Now with our digital backend systems, we can actually calculate and compensate for that delay it gets more interesting when we have multiple sources or we have uh, multiple signals that we're getting from the same source. So if there's some interesting physical characteristics to the source, we'll get a few different signals uh, you know, emanating from it. In this case, we have then two delays um, that we measure. And again, our digital backend systems allow us to measure and compensate for these delays. And really it's those sorts of delays that tell us interesting things about what it is that we are observing. So finally, where do we actually fit in as the DSP group? Well, this is kind of a, again, high level representation of the Meerkat signal chain all the way from DISH, the digitizer, the receiver, the fiber networks, all the way through to the KAPB. And really this little black or red box in this case captures what our team does. So we are responsible for the end-to-end -end data processing pipeline from raw data, uh, raw digitizer data right through to image. So the correlator is the bit of the system that would work out and compensate for those delays I mentioned. And then the science processing pipeline would actually take those visibilities that we produce and turn them into radio images. So to start off, uh, not yet, quickly, uh, project involvement. So I'm just going to end up on this slide. 
we are involved in a number of projects at Sereo. So Mirkin and Mirkin Extension, most of you know about. We build the currently the beamformer for both projects, the science data processing pipelines, and also the high-speed data network. Uh, on AVN, um, we've built uh, the single dish backend system. And then we also have a couple of R&D projects, the SmartNIC that I mentioned, we are involved with the hard drive spectrometer upgrade, as well as a hard drive VLBI correlator. And then there's some computational DSP. And then for SKA MID, uh, some of us, and again, not to single out Alec, um, Alec is involved in some of the correlator acceptance and integration verification uh, activities. All right, so yeah, that's it from me. I hope you enjoy the rest of this talk. First up is Andrew and James, and they'll be talking to you or taking you through correlators and data transport. Right, thanks, Taran. Um, <clears throat> so Taran gave a fantastic intro introduction there, uh, made my life a lot easier. Uh, and what I'm going to now do is lift the lid on uh, what he's got uh, showing up here to show you a little bit a sneak peek of what's actually underneath the hood and how we actually do all of this uh, from a relatively high level DSP uh, perspective. Right, so looking at this in a very high 40,000 foot view uh, kind of way, we have currently 64 antennas on site and each of the receivers on those antennas are basically converting electromagnetic radiation, what's being received into raw voltages. Those voltages are digitized, or that, that those signals are digitized and then sent uh, through a network, which uh, we'll discuss shortly, into what we call our F engine. And this is the first uh, entry point to the overall correlator. Uh, what it's essentially doing is just doing the process of channelization. We'll go a little bit into that shortly. Um, but it's effectively taking this uh, signal, breaking it up into various frequency um, components, which indicate what it is um, present within that signal, uh, and uh, then sending it off to uh, what we call the correlator, well, which is actually an X engine. So this is conceptually what's actually happening. And each dish has got its own individual channelizer, but all of that data gets brought together uh, in the correlator to produce the um, a uh, product, um, which we're calling visibilities. Taking a slightly deeper dive into the actual F engine, just looking at it from a single antenna perspective, but it carries for each one of them, is we push it through what's called a channelizer. Now it's simply represented by a single block here. You'll see the, uh, uh, the finer details of, of it shortly. But in essence, what we're doing is we're taking the signal, an analog signal at that. Um, what's happening up in the front end is if in this particular case, we look at L-band, we're digitizing an 856 megahertz bit of bandwidth, and then we literally split it into chunks, um, to hold the analogy really, in the frequency domain. And we want to see what is relevant within each particular um, frequency component of that particular signal. That then gets sent uh, further down the line um, for further processing. But I have to first just deviate at this point and say, you may have heard of some a few terms. There are actually two variants of our F engine. Uh, we do what's called wide band and narrow band. And this slide just depicts the difference between the two of them. Sorry, the coloring is not so great here, but effectively we have our, in the wide band case, we have an 856 megahertz bandwidth that gets digitized and channelized. And in narrow band, it's the same 856 megahertz. The only difference um, is we take a chunk of it, 107 megahertz or 54 megahertz of it and that can be positioned anywhere within that 856 megahertz band. And that then gets further processed. The other uh, difference between the two of them in wideband, we have got three flavors that you can work with being a 1024 channel version, a 4096 channel version, or a 32768 channel version. Uh, in narrowband, there's only the 32K version of it. Um, and whether you're digitizing 53 and a half megahertz or 107 megahertz, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. Taking an even gorier look at our uh, F engine, Tyrone mentioned a few things like delay compensation. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide, but this is just to show that there's a lot that happens under the hood. It's not just a simple case of taking some data, pushing it through an FFT and uh, you've got your result. Um, where there's quite a lot that happens from unpacking, from time stamping, delay corrections, both in time and frequency domain, uh, equalization, and of course the, the channelization itself. But that, all of that now gets sent one step further down the line into our correlator. Now, this again is at a very high level view. As you can appreciate, there's more than one dish on site. There's 64 of them. And uh, I don't know, somebody can just uh, commute themselves. Um, the problem 
is scaled roughly by the square of the amount of antennas. And effectively what you're doing is you're taking one antenna and you have to um, compute or multiply its products with every other antenna. So as you can appreciate, as the number of antennas go up, so does the, the, the problem space. But at its heart, it's very simple. You're taking the spectra that's produced by one antenna and you cross multiplying it with another. And you're doing this in frequency domain as a, uh, uh, the process of correlation. And this produces an intermediate product, uh, which is what science processing cares about. And Kim will talk about that uh, in greater detail. Uh, conceptually, how we actually do this, um, Omer originally referred to scarab boards that we use on site. This does our processing. And it's not just one board that does this. We have to split this problem out across many boards. Um, it's just the amount of data rate, that, the data that we're talking about, the rate of it, um, and uh, the amount of processing that's required is not uh, possible on, on a single device. So this gets split out amongst many. And how we do this is we take sections of the channelized data and we send them off to the various X engines that have been uh, given the particular task. So all of the data from one particular section of the band from all antennas goes to one particular X engine core. And then another X engine core gets another section of the band. So they're getting data from every single antenna uh, to be able to do the cross multiplication. And then this gets uh, brought together. Uh, there's one extra section to it, which I'm not going to go into any any great length at all, but there's a what we call a B engine, which is beamforming. Uh, that is if you want to, instead of using 64 dishes, indep 64 dishes independently, you want to uh, create uh, uh, beams or uh, basically a larger antenna out of some of them, and you want to steer that beam. So we do have logic that's in place to do that as well. That's also happen happens in frequency domain, uh, but that's a, a, different, uh, a different animal in itself. So how is this all linked together? Uh, we've seen some top level views of where we have the DISH and the D engine. Uh, Heno um, and CS talked about that earlier in the week. This thing gets stitched together in a uh, 40 gigabit Ethernet network. And we have these uh, various processing levels of F engines, both the wide and narrow band, and our X engines, and the data is flowing between them. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to James, who's going to take you through the Ethernet network side of things. Uh, and then I will resume with the FPGA side of stuff. Okay, thanks, Andrew. You're making me feel weird. I th feel like I need to tell jokes or something. Um, okay, so the point that Andrew made previously is that um, all of these individual uh, bits and pieces need to talk to each other somehow. Uh, this is There's a lot of computation that's going on here, and it, it can't all happen on one on one platform, on one box. Uh, and so he's nicely labeled it there as ethernet. Uh, and that is what we do. So this is what we don't do. Um, image credit to the European Space Agency here. This is a, um, this is a, 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 a tiny zoomed in uh, photo from Alma's correlator, uh, Alma in, in South America. And you can see there that these are individual custom little boards and they've got Xilinx uh, circuits on them, very similar to the ones that we use uh, in our scarabs. Um, but the approach that they've taken to getting the boards to talk to each other is to make a, a big backplane. So this is a, a big circuit board with sockets that you plug the individual um, processing boards in. And then, uh, so this has some advantages, it means you have very, very fine, grain, fine grained control of what you wanna do. The disadvantage is that it's a lot of work to do that you it's not really something that you can go to uh incredible connection and just buy off the shelf um and if and if uh, if there's something goes wrong well or if you decide you want to ex expand or upgrade it then then that's harder this is what we do do um we use uh just ethernet um it is it is a little bit faster and a little bit more expensive than the um the kind that you plug into your fiber router at home unless you've got a very very nice fiber router <laughs> in which case i want to know what who your provider is um so this is a this is a photo of of um admittedly now this photo is several years old uh and uh, those who have, have been in the kdra will know why um but this is in rack b1 so th these are each individual off-the-shelf switches. Um, it's just bog-standard Ethernet. 
the these orange cables that are in that are going uh, are in there at the moment are, are connecting to other parts of the network and these are our fiber transceivers that are just waiting to have the um patch leads uh, in in them these are the ones that are going to be connected well they are connected at the moment but when the photo is taken they're going to be connecting um the actual uh, receptors to to the the data network um this is a diagram put together by uh, by Jason, who was um, Tyron's predecessor, uh, or and in a sense my predecessor as well, because he was uh, previously responsible for putting the network together. And it uses an architecture designed uh, at Bell Labs by an engineer named Charles Claus. If you're interested in a bit of a of a history lesson, um, it it has a sort of a two layer thing. There are leaf switches which connect to your actual processing nodes or you know the, your items that need to access the network and then there are spine switches which connect to the leaves to 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 join them all together to provide connectivity uh, for them and the reason that we use this architecture is that it makes it possible for any two of these um, nodes on the network to talk to each other at full speed with no blockages because there is enough bandwidth so for example if you've you've got some someone here on L30 that wants to talk to someone here on L26, they, uh, but there's two sets of these things, then they can both run at full speed with not with no contention for the for the for the bandwidth. Um, yeah, there are some nitty gritty details, but but this is essentially um, off the shelf. Uh, granted, it's the very expensive shelf, the one that they keep out of reach of children. Um, but it's something that we don't have to develop in house. We can we can just buy it, and that saves a lot of engineering time and lets us do the things that we want to do. Ludwig, how is the leaves and the spines? Sorry, how is the leaves and the spines? How are they connected? Is it all the leaves to all the spines? Or yes, okay. yeah, it's a good question. So um, I'm going the wrong direction. Um, yeah, so every every leaf has a connection to every single spine. Um, and and that uh, if you go down into the sort of theory of it, um, so we've got a bit of a system here. These are you you you'll see that the um, the spine connections are precisely half of the number of ports on each leaf. Uh, so that gives when you have full bandwidth in, you can have full bandwidth going out as well. Um, so with the forty gig network, we have um, eighteen spines. Uh, and so each uh, leaf can connect 18 nodes. We only really use 16 of them. So we just have a little bit of extra redundancy. Um, and just because that's a convenient number of scarabs that fit in a rack uh, as well. So um, yeah, but that's a good question. Okay, then back to Andrew. Ah. Yeah. Perfect. I remember uh, back in the day when we had the 16 uh -huh. um, release, dish release, um, there was a lot of issues with the networks. It was almost like we were trying, we were running them at like full capacity and then uh, uh, you want yes. to describe a couple of those? So what you're talking about here is a little bit before my time. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to pass the buck on that one and blame Jason. Uh, yes. So there, there were issues. Um, and we, we drive these links hard. Um, so to give you an idea, the, um, the network is specified for 40 gigabit per second, and we're getting very, very close to that 95 to 98% of the, of the link utilization. Um, and that, that can be quite challenging for even, you know, relatively modern hardware to cope with. So there was a bit of a, um, a process to get the design and the configuration stable. And to Mellanox's credit, they work closely with us uh, until we've got a situation and Alec can either confirm or deny this. Yeah. 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 So, so they have they have uh, worked with us pretty well to uh, to resolve those issues. Um, yeah. Good. Thanks. All right. Thanks, James. Uh, I'm now going to hone in a little bit more on the practical uh, practicality side of it. Uh, he's talked about uh, how we connect these things together. 
Uh, this slide uh, depicts not only that, but also the sort of rates that we're talking about. If you look at, um, if you consider a, it's represented as a single switch in this particular diagram, but it's uh, more than just that, as James has just shown, uh, you have your uh, fiber links from your dishes that are coming in. That's, uh, those rates are in the order of about 34 gigabits per second uh, per antenna. Um, so if you think your fiber at home is something impressive, you're going to go to site. Um, and uh, then that gets sent off the data that gets ingested uh, from by the switch from the uh, from the D engines uh, gets sent off to the first port of call, which is an F engine. And now you'll notice that it's the same hardware for both F and X, and that's because we use the same hardware for both F and X engines. Uh, we just configure them differently. Um, but I'll describe uh, that shortly. Then the the rates drop a little bit after uh, after some of that processing. Uh, and then eventually it lands up in uh, some servers, um, which uh, are SDP pipelines, and they then work their magic with um, with creating the images from the intermediate products that, that we produce. Now, Omar did me a great favor uh, early in the week when he introduced the scarab boards and the roach boards, and he talked about FPGAs, but he didn't really tell you what an FPGA is. So this is a single slide that's going to I'm going to try and use to depict this. So for those who are well versed in this domain, please uh, forgive the oversimplification. Um, but essentially, an FPGA is a silicon device that we can configure to do whatever we want, really, within the realm, within certain bounds of possibilities. Now there is uh, the analogy I'll give you now does fall short in some areas, but essentially you can think of it as if I gave you a box of Lego. You've got red bricks, bricks, you've got green bricks, bricks, you've got blue, and so on. And each of those different colored bricks represents a different logical or electronic feature. It could be as primitive as an AND gate or an OR gate, could be a little bit more complicated, such as a DSP block doing multiply and accumulates, for example. And depending on how you stitch those together will depend on what you're actually going to get out, get uh, processed in the actual chip itself. In the same way, you could take the same, same Lego blocks and build a house now, or a castle, or a truck. It's the same blocks, different, different, um, a different construct. You're getting a different output, but that's essentially what we do. So we configure internally in these chips, electronically. That is, uh, there's no physical uh, wires changing. Um, you have got a configurable network mesh, and you have got configurable logic, and we uh, cherry pick what we want to do, and uh, that is how these chips um, actually do what we want. So they're highly configurable uh, and uh, very advantageous for the type of processing that we want uh, to do. Now, the question is why? Why do we actually use FPGAs? There are other, why not just use a normal CPU? And that goes down to simple architecture. And CPUs are very good at certain particular um, functions, particularly um, sequential based things. Yes, there are multi-core processes, that's, so that analogy does fall, fall away slightly. The difference with FPGAs is because they're so custom and you've got this fabric that you can play with, they're exceptionally good at high bandwidth processing. And that's why they have been the flavor of the month in radio astronomy for a long time. Uh, Omar, I think, referred to the roach boards being a few hundred out in the wild at the moment. That is absolutely true. Um, in, uh, in our particular case, Cat7 was built with roach. And then in initial stages of Meerkat was built with roach too. Uh, and uh, then we moved over onto Scarab. But the point is that you can take, um, do multiple things in parallel, assuming you've designed it like this, you can do multiple things in parallel um, at lower clock rates than what you could on, uh, for example, an equivalent CPU. So they're really, really good at those sort of tasks. Um, Omer now did also introduce some of these boards for us. Um, there are other FPGA boards that are used in the radio astronomy field. Um, we've only really looked at Roach 1, 2s, and now currently Scarabs. Uh, on site, there's 288 of these pizza box looking boards. Each one contains its own uh, FPGA and each one gets configured and uh, depending on the instrument that's being built will depend on how many are being used and how they are being configured whether it's an F engine or an X engine um, and uh, that all happens uh, automatically um, behind the scenes. Um, re uh, FPGAs while they are still good and have certainly got uh, their own uh, niche market and niche area where they are used there is uh, a new sheriff in town um, and uh, I'm going to hand over to James to talk about that new sheriff. He's the, the head commissioner here for the GPUs. And uh, that is something else that's getting uh, traction now in, uh, in uh, the radio astronomy field. 
Um, okay, so the the background to that has is the Meerkat extension project. Uh, if you add um, twenty extra, twenty odd extra antennas, then up to twenty extra antennas, we say, you need to plug them in somewhere. Uh, and Meerkat's correlator that we have talked about up to now was kind of already at its limits. We we had expanded it once already. Uh, it was designed to do that, but it was as, as far as we could push that particular architecture. Um, and the Scarab platform that Andrew mentioned is, uh, uh, it started off life in 2017, so it's now a few years old. Uh, anyone who's still using a computer from 2017, well done. Um, it's, it's unusual. So I think the Scarabs have, have, have done well. Um, so we, we did probably about a year's worth of, um, of exploration to see what is the next, what are we going to do next for the, to build a bigger correlator? Um, and ultimately we settled on, on using consumer GPUs. A GPU is a graphics processing unit. Um, and this is a vastly oversimplified explanation of what it is. Uh, GPUs started off life um, back in the eighties as uh, specialized circuitry in video game arcades for making graphics on, you know, Street Fighter or Tekken or, you know, Amish is nodding. <laughs> he, he remembers the corner cafe on those hot summer afternoons. Um, so this is, this is what they were doing. And, and the profit motive there uh, was, you know, build better GPUs, build better gra uh, graphics so you can sell more games. After a while, um, some people realized that these GPUs, the particular architecture of, of them, so they had, their task is one thing. So calculations in order to render a matrix of numbers, which is then translated by uh, some decoding uh, logic to the colors that you see on a screen. Like I said, after a while, some clever people figured out that you could use these same kinds of circuits to do number crunching. And because they was they used to hand, handling large blocks of numbers, they could do it very quickly and very efficiently. Um, so things like big data, machine learning, AI have become industry drivers and there's big money in that. So lots of research and development towards making bigger, faster, better GPUs. Um, this wasn't always true. Uh, up and, and in fact, it's only been true for the last sort of two or three years that we've had G, uh, GPUs and the surrounding um, infrastructure that's capable of handling the bandwidths that that we need for, for radio astronomy DSP, but now they are. So we're at the point now where um, for about 15 or 20,000 Rand, you can go to the shops and walk out with a, a device that is capable of doing the work of between four and eight scarabs depending on how you configure them. Uh, that's, I may have oversimplified things ever so slightly there uh, because you do need to plug your GPU into something. Once you have all these other bits, uh, the cost does go up a little bit. Um, so to give you an idea, but I mean, it's still pretty good going. To give you an idea, one of these server boxes fully configured costs about 100,000 Rand. It's doing the work of four, four to eight scarabs. So it's, I think we win. The scarabs were very, very expensive just because of those FPGAs that were in them. Um, so, um, sorry, I've had a brain freeze and my notes are not here. Any, any questions on that so far? No, it's okay. That's Hi there. I'd like to, to know, my name is Virushan. I'm from Autonom Solutions in Joburg. I'd just like to know how long does it typically take to write code that's optimally um, uh, programmed for GPU deployment? How long is a piece of string? Could, could be anything, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, yeah. I... You're asking a hard question there. Uh, you you need to. There's a truism that software is is never complete; it's just abandoned. Mm. Um, so if we wanted to, we could carry on tweaking this to the nth degree. But you know, the the I think the the most of the gains that we've had are, are there. You 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 kind of have to do a trade-off between you know how much time you have to develop and and what your really your requirements are. Um, we have we have 
well i, I can answer the the question in more detail if you if you're interested mm. um but to give you an idea we've got a correlator at the moment and it's taken us about sort of two years of of development uh with three three engineers mm. this is the scarab one which took a lot longer with a lot more people yes. five years with about seven people uh so the the turnaround time is a lot quicker um and there are there are reasons for that um you know the gpu programming is a lot a lot more mature a lot more well supported it's a lot less niche than than doing things on fpgas sure. uh, that answer your question Rushan? is there uh yes no it does um thank you for that so yeah it just it just depends some problems are easier to solve than others so they happen quickly someone some take a little bit longer sure. um yeah there was a question back there Uh, okay, so just for the benefit of those online, the question is, is, is a GPU similar to an FPGA or a CPU? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so FPGAs have, uh, and the, how they work really under the hood is, is very proprietary secrets of, of Intel and AMD. Um, but essentially, no, they, they have programmable logic. So there's, there's, um, you can program the logic to be however, it, whatever, to do whatever hardware function that you want it to do. And they have these sort of stripes are representing connections. So you, if you want to have, you know, an adder and then a shift register and what have you, you need to connect them up somehow. Um, so FPGAs can essentially do whatever you want them to do. You could have a soft core CPU. And program that into the logic or you can have a more a gpu kind of thing what's typically done is a mixture of parallelism and pipelining so uh, they can work on multiple things at once but also you chop your work up into sort of various stages and the slide that andrew showed over here is an example of that so while one bit of data is being un sort of okay we we unpack some data from the network and then we do some synchronization, then we do some delaying. And while that's happening, the next sort of thing is busy occupying the previous stage in a pipeline. Uh, on a GPU, on the other hand, it tends to work more in batches. Um, so if I have to make a different analogy, an FPGA is a bit more like an escalator and a GPU is like an elevator. I'm seeing, I'm seeing like nods from a, so I think, it started to click so both of them are for moving people from one floor to the next but one of them does it in a sort of a streamlined pipeline fashion the other one the gpu you you kind of you've got to pack people in and it takes a while to pack them in but once the, it's full you can actually move a lot of people to the next floor very quickly um and that's essentially what we're doing in with with these with these gpus is that we because uh, ram is so cheap so that's that's a difference between in FPGA land memory is very very expensive. There's not a lot of it, so you've got to be very conservative about um, how you use it. On the other hand, and if you if you're in a server with 64 gigs of RAM, you can bun, uh, you can buffer up a lot of data, transfer that to the GPU, and the GPU can work its magic uh, on a lot of data in parallel very quickly. So it seems like it's real time, but it's really processing batches just very very quickly. Make sense? Um, There's a question in the chat, but okay. it might be a tongue-in-cheek statement rather than a question. It's does the does that make the CPU a staircase? Yes, but a staircase with Usain Bolt <laughs> running up and down. <laughs> uh, although I don't know if he'd like staircases very much. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's what our correlator in the KDRA looks like it's currently not powered up. So the um, the computers are there. We're just waiting for for networking at the moment. Uh, it's it's going to look like that. That's that's not a photo of the actual thing. That's just Nvidia's marketing materials. But you know, they, they've been ordered and they're on the way. So watch this space. Um, yeah. Okay. I think that's that's me. Ty, do you want to? 
Okay. Uh, thank you, James and Andrew. Um, yeah, I just want to quickly go back to that comment about how long does it take to write code. Um, it also does come down to cost as well. So J James mentioned the GP that we're using for Meerkat extension. I think we paid about 12,000 actually for them. Initially, when we wrote the F engine code, we were running it on a GPU that cost about 40,000 Rand. So it took us a few months of, you know, optimization to actually get it down to that. So if we were happy to spend more money on the correlator, it would have taken us a lot, lot um, a lot fewer months. Um, so yeah, because we are cost bound, as most of you know, uh, we spend a lot more time developing things. Um, but yeah, that's it for the correlator. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Because now we're going to jump over to the other part of the processing pipeline. So it's going to be a whole new world um, once we cross this threshold. Are there any questions in the chat? Let's see. Okay, cool. Well, then, thanks again to James and Andrew. Um, and next up, we have Kim from the Pipelines team who's going to walk you through making images, among other things. Uh, yeah, so um, as we've already heard all about the correlator part, and the correlator spits out these magic things called visibilities. And those appear in the pipelines team, and then we work our magic on them, as being alluded to. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, will that work? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so the reason that radio interferometry works is because there's this very convenient relationship between the visibilities that the correlator has just conveniently spat out for us and this uh, picture of the sky. And uh, it's, it's this relationship here. You don't really have to know that much about it, but if you're technically minded, you'll recognize it as a Fourier transform. So if you just plotted your visibility straight from the correlator, what you would see would be very unintuitive and you wouldn't really know what to do with it. So what we want really is images because that's something that we understand. And that is basically what SDP is trying to do effectively. And I'll try and explain in more detail how we achieve that. So these are your visibilities and this is what the sky looks like in case you've never seen a radio image before, but I'm sure you probably have. Um, yeah, so the SDP pipeline has these kind of four main systems. The first part is SDP ingest. So all the very high time resolution data from the correlator arrives here like a whole deluge of it. And SDP's job is just to ingest that, the ingest, and to turn it into something that is averaged down to a slightly more manageable rate so that we can process it more easily in all of our downstream processes. So um, <clears throat> just to give you an idea, when the visibility data is um, has like half a hertz frequency, which is about four seconds, actually typically, typically we average it down from the half seconds in the correlator to eight seconds, then an eight hour observation is about 40 terabytes of data. So we're processing large volumes of data and we need to try to slim that down as much as possible. After ingest, the very next process we have is the calibration pipeline, which um, does what it says, it calibrates the data and we'll give you more detail on that. And that produces calibration tables and also flags, and our calibration tables get put in the, this, this kind of custom metadata store called the telescope state. So between these processes, these arrows are meant to suggest that it's really only data, so only visibilities and flags that flow between here, and all of our metadata is stored in this telescope state and then can be accessed by any, any one of these um, processing steps. Once you've calibrated the data, then we can move on to the next step, which is imaging. And there are two flavors of imaging. There's continuum imaging. So continuum imaging really is when you try to image emission that is present at all wavelengths. So when you look at like a light bulb, what you see with your eye is continuum emission, right? There's emission at all wavelengths. And if you're an optical astronomer, you call this photometry. And if you're a radio astronomer, you call it continuum. And you make one image that integrates or adds together all of the emission in all the wavelengths. So you get visibilities in and you get one, one image out. Once you're done with that step, then we move on to the spectral imager. So spectral imaging is when you only have emission in very distinct discrete regions of frequency or wavelength space. So you only have emission in a very small part of your bandwidth and you make multiple images 
for every single frequency space that you sample. So for the 32,000 channels, you have 32,000 images, which means that you've got 7,000 pixels by 7,000 pixels by 32,000 channels that you end up with roughly a 12 terabyte image. So it's also you know, very process intensive. <laughs> okay. Do you have any questions at this point? Yes. That's terrible. Don't record what I'm saying. Hello. Sorry, uh, engineer here. Um, <laughs> the, it always breaks down at this point here. I'm very confused at, at that visibilities. What, when, when, when they discuss the visibilities and going into the, the imaging, what, what you just explained. Could you go back a slide and just explain that again, please? Um, sure. So, so I understand that the visibilities come out from the correlator. And are those just like individual values, like um, yeah, yeah, the individual voltages from each antenna have been multiplied together, yeah, and it's just going to dump out one complex number for every channel that you've sampled, which is that multiply multiplication yeah, or the, correlation at, at the output of the correlator, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so that's just an in, in like a intensity value or, or not intensity, just a, a, a voltage value. Yeah. Okay. Effectively. Okay, so the Sorry. Um, yeah, there's a the if you if you've ever tried the the double slit experiment, but but not from a from a quantum physics perspective, uh, you know, shine light between two two slits and you'll see a sort of a wave interference pattern. Um, you can think of of um, a, a pair a baseline as just like two slits measuring the 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 sort of the radio light, and you can th that gives you insight into what is happening uh, in the is it in parallel or perpendicular? Anyway, in, in one sort of dimension. And that's one of the reasons that we try and come, you know, have lots of different baselines so that you can sample this this uh, this space in many different ways. So, so Kim will have some more slides about that soon. Is that, are yeah, you happy? So, so, and, and, and what you're saying is that between that, um, that complex number that comes out of the correlator, there's some, some Fourier relationship to the image that you have in the sky. Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, I've got another question. This 12 terabyte image sounds very hectic. How long does it take to do like basic processing with it? So I think that um, we, we process it massively in parallel. So we have multiple mm -hmm. machines running it and we try to, I think it's roughly, we try to do it within two hours of our, wow. so if it's eight hour observation, you want it to be out within 16 hours or 32,000 channels. That's okay. our sort of requirement within 16 hours yes all right thank you so um sorry before we continue can the people online hear me clearly yes okay so we'll use the mic going forward um the last question before that apparently you didn't hear is that correct does it need to be repeated Um, Just yes. Yeah. Um, like when they were talking, it was too low, so we couldn't hear it. If they would repeat it, that would be great. Testing one, two. Sorry, I can't remember my question now, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it had something to do with the, the relationship between the visibilities and the, and the sky image. And I, what I got out of it is that there's some Fourier relationship between the visibilities. The visibility is the output of the correlator. And that's some complex number that comes out of that. Okay, is that okay? okay. We'll go back. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So that that is the magic that that equation. Um, but you don't have to understand the details too too much. Um, we'll try and kind of keep it light. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> 
uh, this is this is ingest, which was um, uh, written mostly by Bruce Mary, who's now part of the correlator team. And this, you know, takes in the massive deluge of data uh, as as coming out of the correlator and does basically these steps. It converts it from an integer to floating point. It uh, applies flags. We'll discuss flags in more detail, but a flag is just it's just a mask of data that you think is bad, effectively. So it's data that you want to 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 mark as being possibly not useful so that you can throw it away later if you don't want to. It detects RFI, which we're now all familiar with because of engineering week. And it does this on the same time resolution as the correlators dumps. So it does it at the original half second dump rates. And then it creates these averaged in time and frequency streams that then go to the down, downstream processes for us to use in a, in a less um, hectic way. And it computes assorted statistics for the signal displays. So if you've ever looked at the signal displays on the CAM GUI or on the Grafana dashboard, that all comes from ingest effectively. <clears throat> and then we move on to the calibration pipeline. So why do you need to calibrate? Yeah, yes. Sorry, Finn. Uh, one question I want to ask. Um, I know Andrew, and you have a floating point representation of the polyphase filter bank. Um, obviously, at some point, you must convert it to integer again. Um, um, is there a reason we know to send floating point through? Um, is it obviously, I think, bandwidth would be an issue? Yeah, so there's a, a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, bandwidth, you know, egress out of the FPGA, as James alluded, is, you know, it's, uh, we're really pushing the upper limit on what we can do on a 40 gig link. Uh, also memory, internally in the FPGA, BRAM or block RAM is a very, uh, you know, a scarce resource. And in some designs, we're really pushing, you know, to, at sort of 80, 90% um, capacity. Now, somebody might say, well, there's still 10% to use. It's unfortunately not quite as simple as that. Uh, when it comes to getting a design on chip, you have to do what's called closing timing, uh, which makes means you've got to get your design not only to fit in terms of all the available resources, but you've also got to get it to make timing so that for a particular clock frequency you want to run, uh, your signals have got to be able to make it through the chip within a certain time frame. So you've got your um, you've got limits as to what you can do there. So of course you can't have too much of the stuff spread out all over all over the chip. We're not going to be able to use it. So you can never get get the hundred percent resource utilization out of the chip anyway. And if we look at the thirty two k design, uh, you've got uh, you know a better chance of um, you know finding peace in uh, Eastern Europe at the moment than you do having that design making timing. So, you know, it's unfortunately, it's just, it's so tight. It is, uh, we, we don't have the luxury of working with floating point on that chip. Uh, if we were to go to newer generation um, um, FPGAs, there's a lot more available resources. But as James said, that uh, the Scarab board is 2017 dated. So we used the best we could at the time. Um, any more questions on ingest, sorry? Uh, thank you. I just want to ask, um, from the correlator, you have like these dumps at half a second. Is there a reason why we can't like, but then we average them to eight seconds. So is there a reason why we can't just have them as like eight second dumps from the correlator straight? Why do we have to, is there any maybe scientific reason why do you have to have that high dump rate? Um, so Bruce is listening, so he'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the correlator doesn't do any detection of RFI or anything like that. Um, the, the, it, that's the, the sort of the job of the ingest machine. Uh, and the ingest machine does it. Uh, Kim, can you go one slide, two slides back? Okay. Um, the, it detects RFI by having access to a fairly large portion of the band. And if you have this much data and you see, ah, this, this sticks up quite a bit over the other stuff, then you can kind of safely say that that's RFI. The X engines have just this little slice that they're calculating. So in principle, we could do it, but then they would need to talk to each other to sort of communicate these, these kinds of things, um, which is hard to do in real time. 
it's it's an idea that I've got percolating in the back of my mind somewhere, but I haven't thought of a good way to do it yet. Um, but yeah, that that's one of the primary reasons that that it's not done like that. Yeah. So if I can add to that, the at least the initial idea was that we do this RFI detection at that half a second rate, so that if there's some sort of sporadic RFI from you know electoral shorting or something, we could pick it up before we average it together with good data. Uh, it's not entirely clear that that's actually proved to be effective, and I think it might be getting reconsidered for the Meerkat extension. Uh, thanks, Bruce. That was useful. Okay. Uh, any more questions on ingest? <laughs> Luckily, Bruce is on the call, so he can actually answer them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we'll move on to calibration now. Um, so why um why do you have to calibrate well basically there's just a whole bunch of corrupting effects as your signal is traveling from the source in the sky all the way down to your computer chip like lots of things happen to it and at the end the thing that you're actually measuring is actually very different from the visibility that i put in that nice equation at the top you don't actually have that when you actually start processing and so um, if you were to just image what came directly out of the correlator, it would look pretty terrible. You wouldn't really see anything useful. Um, you know, some of these effects are things like the atmosphere. So I think a very relatable thing is if you're standing on the hill at like lion's head or something and looking over the city, you can see that the lights of the city twinkle, right? And you, you know that it's twinkling because of the atmosphere, like this little bits of atmosphere are refracting the light and it's causing that effect that the lights kind of move and they change in their um, in their intensity. And so you have a very similar kind of thing in the radio. You can, um, the atmosphere will cause the phases of your sources to shift and for their positions to shift and the image will become defocused. But including all these other effects just makes that even more extreme. So the point of calibration is to remove most of those corrupting effects. And we typically do that by modeling them. But some corrupting effects like RFI, are harder to model and they're also relatively confined so we just flag them and chuck them away rather than going through the work of modeling them um so just what we kind of really do here in the calibration pipeline is we model it and try to measure that modeled effect by using pre-known calibrator sources so you already know what the visibilities for those calibrator sources should look like so you have model visibilities because you already know the features of that particular source and you have measured visibilities and then you just do a model fit and you work out these calibration solutions, which conveniently can almost always be expressed as um, antenna based values. So instead of having n squared calibration solutions, now you only need n and you can store those in telescope state, which then kind of keeps everything relatively simple. And the goal then is to take visibilities that look like this when they came in to something that looks like this, because this is what you think your <laughs> calibrator should look like. Uh, yes. Um, if you just go back a slide, you listed a few um, interference, uh, so I can say atmospheric effects, for instance. How dynamic is that? And how often do you have to update your calibration? So it depends a lot on your um, individual wavelength. You know, different wavelengths have different effects, but say for meerkats, I mean, we typically only have to do atmospheric type calibrations kind of every hour, and we think it's relatively stable, but then that's when you visit a calibrator, but then we'll discuss further on, you can do self calibration, which allows you to resolve those effects on a higher time resolution, and then you can go down to like 30 seconds if you want to. Okay, so you don't have to visit a calibrator every 30 seconds, but you need to take out those effects relatively quickly. Um, yeah, and so once you put these things in the telescope state, they end up in our data file and you can dynamically apply these calibration solutions. So one point about um, our data is that we don't really change the data once it comes out of ingest. All we do is take the visibilities from the correlator and we average it and then that is what ends up in the archive. And all of this other processing like the calibration is just metadata that you can dynamically use to alter your, your data as you need it. And you have the option to use it or not use it or only use part of it as you would like. So that allows kind of a flexible calibration model. After that, so the other thing about the 
calibration pipeline, sorry, I should have mentioned, is that it's running basically while the observation proceeds. So we buffer up data as it comes in and calibrate it on a sort of chunk by chunk basis. And roughly 10 to 15 minutes after the observation is done, you're done with calibration. And we can start straight away with imaging. And this is a kind of fairly unusual system. Not many other telescopes do it like this. So it's kind of specific to Meerkat. So then we move on to the continuum imaging process. And this um, process has three kind of important goals. One, it does self calibration, which is a new step of like a second order calibration on top of the calibration we've already done. It does imaging and deconvolution. So it makes the actual images and it does continuum subtraction which you need for the next step, which is the spectral line imaging. So self-calibration, um, so as we're kind of just discussing about the atmosphere, the problem is when you calibrate on a calibrator that's not exactly in the same part of the sky as your target, the atmosphere is not exactly the same. So you'll never get the best quality image that you can get. And so in the 90s, they invented this self-calibration to get around this problem. So what you do in self-calibration is you make an initial image from your roughly calibrated data that from the previous step. And that's usually good enough that you can kind of see some little sources in there. I don't know how well this image is showing up, but there are little sources. And so you make a model from your rough image, and then you do the same process that we did before. You make your, your model visibilities, you solve for your calibration terms, and then you just iterate through this process. And eventually, it will if everything goes well, it will converge and you get a reasonably good image effectively. It's kind of magic, but it does work. But because you actually need this image, obviously the step is like inextricably linked with the imaging. You can't actually separate it from the imaging. That's why it's in this part of the process. And, um, and then you have to make the actual image. So what goes into imaging? One is this Fourier transforming of the visibilities. And that's, it's a little bit complicated because it's not exactly a Fourier transform. But also you have to compensate for the fact that you have incomplete sampling with your telescopes. <clears throat> so those visibilities are a function of what we call UV space, which is the separation between the antennas. And if you could just blanket the whole earth with antennas, then you would sample the space perfectly and you would have a great image. But obviously that's not practical. You just have a few antennas. So you only have a smallish sample here. And so because of that, there's some distortion in your image because of this incomplete sampling. And as I'm talking to a bunch of engineers, I don't really think I need to explain this in too much detail, but just for anybody who's maybe not familiar, you can kind of just think of it as like you're on your WhatsApp call and there's some bad connection. And the worse the connection is, the harder it is to hear the person, right? So the more sampling you have, the better the connection, the better the call kind of thing. Yes. Oh, sorry, the mic. In your previous slide, so you said that you um, you iterate towards a solution. Yes. And what is the what is the th how do you decide the threshold that something is good enough? Is it a manual or automated thing? So you so in the you can set it like just an like an auto a threshold. I only want to do this so many times if you want to. Normally with something like Meerkat, you just come up with a heuristic, like I think this will work most of the time because it kind of does work. Or you can try to say like, how much is your solution changing? You know, is there a large change in your solution or is it more or less staying the same? And the same, is the image improving? Like, is your noise going down? Is the residual that you're getting smaller? And once that starts to flatline, like there's not much point anymore in continuing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so so that, that is what deconvolution is. It's kind of removing the effect of this in, incomplete sampling. And there's so the the worse your sampling is, this is a this is a image from the VLA. If you only have a very short observation, you'll have very incomplete sampling. But luckily, when the Earth rotates, that that vector of the separation is actually going to rotate from the perspective of the source. And so you can fill in this UV plane. And that gives you more and more sampling. So the more sampling you have, the better your image will be. And you can kind of get that for free by just observing for longer. But roughly once you get to eight hours here, I mean, you can see rotating more isn't gonna give you any better sampling. So there is a limit here, but the better you sample, the better it's gonna look. 
But on top of that, we can also improve on that by doing some extra processing to try to remove this um, effect, this distortion effect. And um, <clears throat> the way that this kind of works is that, roughly speaking, the, the distortion is if you have your picture of the sky, then these are little point sources. The distortion is that every single point gets convolved with something called the point spread function, which is the Fourier transform of your um, UV distribution. So then the image will look like this. Every point will just be surrounded by this, this point spread function. And, and we call this the dirty image when it comes out in its natural form. Once you Fourier transformed it, this is how it looks. And when you want to deconvolve, you really just do this process in reverse using an algorithm called clean as the most basic one. There are many other kinds of ways of doing it, but this is what we typically do. You just say, here's a point. I take this point, I subtract out the point spread function, and I put back the point. <laughs> so you just do this in reverse, and you do it many, many times, and then at the end you get a better looking image, <laughs> effectively. So that's what we're doing. We're doing the calibration and the imaging, and we do this iteratively until everything converges, and then we store our calibration solutions in tell state, and we also store this model image in tell state. Oops, sorry, I went too far. <laughs> I went too far. <laughs> <laughs> in tell state and uh, so that you can then um, do the next step which is the continuum image I mean the uh, spectral line imaging okay so once the continuum imager is done then we move on to spectral line so spectral line like I said um, is, uh, is is really confined to just a few small channels and continuum tends to be much, much brighter. So if you ever looked at a meerkat continuum image, you'll just see thousands of sources. The image is very dominated by that. And your spectral line image is going to be much fainter. And it's also going to be present for only a few small channels. So it's very hard for you to see that with all that confusing continuum em emission in there. So typically, we just subtract it all out to make it easier to detect the thing that you're actually interested in. So this is, uh, you can't really see it that well, but this is a continuum image. And this is a an image, a spectral line image of an empty channel. So if you look through these 32,000 images, only a few of them actually have something in. The rest of it's just basically empty. And you'll see then this is a spectral line image um, where you've got a few channels where there is emission and the emission changes in every channel. Whereas if you had a, a channel image like this of the continuum, it would all look the same, right? Every, every channel would look exactly the same. And so I have here um, a movie which is stepping through some channels of an actual galaxy detected with the actual SDP pipeline. So um, yeah, so the contours here outline the, the overall shape of the galaxy and you'll see the spectral line coming in and out as it goes. See, there you go. The emission is now starting and it's moving. <laughs> and then the reason that you have uh, the emission in different channels here is because the emission is is emitted at the same you know native frequency because it depends on your atomic processes but it's in different channels here because there's doppler doppler motion so you're actually seeing the movement of these um of the the gas in this galaxy and um <clears throat> i'm not a spectral line scientist so it took me a while to make the, the, these plots <laughs> but uh this is just another example showing you this is the overall profile of the galaxy. This is what it looks like in one channel. And then you can take a, you know, a slice in frequency across this, and then you'll see this is the actual emission as a function of frequency for that whole block. Um, and this is just a nicer picture, a nicer version of that. And yeah, any questions about spectral line? Sorry, just back to the UV space. Um, does it make any sense to do in interpolation to do... Um during that deconvolution process to get some more resolution? Does that make any sense or is it not really help? I After think this, and the point spread, point spread function, the only technique that you apply there. Yeah, well, we only really use clean. There are multiple um, methods of trying to get rid of this effect. I mean, I think you could call clean like a fancy interpolation, really, but the man in front of you, Ludwig, is more of an expert on these kind of things than me. So I'm sure he can give you some um, useful tips on that. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the the interpolation sort of happens implicitly through the through the clean algorithm, but it also extrapolates beyond the dishes. So it's sort of saying you're assuming the sky is full of small point sources, and that means 
they sort of the visibilities would have gone on beyond your telescope's reach and you sort of extrapolate as, it as well as part of the process. Okay, then yeah, this is really my last slide. Oh no, I forgot, we're doing flagging. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I forgot about the flagging. Okay, yeah. So as I said before, a flag just marks faulty data, so it can be excluded from processing um, as desired. And flags are one of the things that the SDP kind of adds to the whole uh, data mix. And our flags are stored in eight bits, where every different bit means a different type of flag. So here it's not just whether to exclude it or not, but why you think it's excluded. These are the different types of flags, and I've highlighted in purple the ones that the SDP kind of produces, and it roughly follows the data processing flow along here. So reserved is not used, um, luckily. <laughs> and then we have uh, uh, what we call, these are the CAM flags. So CAM flags are really, I think as Ludwig will say, it's really anything that you know about that the system knows about that can tell you that the data is faulty. So Things like, is there a sensor that says there's the, the antennas in Winstow? Is there a data suspect sensor? Anything that the system already knows about gets marked as a CAM flag. Data lost is um, what it sounds like. Data's gone missing, either typically between the CBF and ingest if data's gone missing there. But also if you're accessing data from the archive and there's like a flaky link to the archive, it will also mark that as data lost. And uh, we have this, this dream of predicted RFI, which is currently not used, but you could hopefully one day predict all the satellite RFI, which would be useful, but we just haven't had time to implement that yet. So then the main flags that we already have is we have a static mask. So the static mask masks the edges where the, where the filter roll off is, because we don't really want to use that for science. That's marked, masked all the time. And then we also mask very badly RFI polluted regions, and we only mask those on less than one kilometer baselines. And we basically mask those because our RFI detection algorithms are just not very good at doing this very well. So we just say it's bad all the time and we throw it out. And we don't really want to keep this data because it tends to um, really corrupt our calibration solutions, which then get fed back into your data and it just becomes kind of self-reinforcing. Then we have the ingest RFI, which as Bruce said, was this idea that you would um, detect RFI at a very high time resolution. But because we have very high data volumes there and we really need to process things very quickly, it's kind of a more basic level um, RFI flagger where it just does um, a median absolute deviation filter and it only, it only throws away the really worst case RFI and um, uh, and it only detects it in one dimension across frequencies, basically. And this is the RFI that you see displayed on the signal displays because obviously the signal displays come from ingest. Then we have the calibration RFI detection. So here it's detected at the longer eight second dump time. So not such high time resolution. And it has a slightly, um, you know, it's less conservative. It tries to flag as much as possible and, um, and it basically detects these, you know, amplitude spikes across the um, across the frequency space, but it detects both in time and frequency space, and it has a slightly more um, signal processing type approach to getting rid of this RFI. And um, then we also have something called the post-processing flag, which is um, a flag that gets applied if something has gone wrong with our calibration, and it's basically applied by CatDel if you open the file and try to apply calibration and it finds that there's a problem with our calibration solutions, for example. Um, yeah, so that's flagging. And so in the end, you have these, all these products in the archive, which are <clears throat> built on top of the products built by the correlator. And most of these things are things that are produced by SDP. So you have the data file here, which includes the data um, which is the data from ingest plus the metadata, which was added to by all these um, other processes. And you have um, <clears throat> the images from this, both the spectral and continuum line imager and this little report here that tells you how the calibration went and a few other reports. So any of these things can be accessed by ourselves for internal quality assurance or by scientists who want to use it to do science. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kim. I just want to check if there's any more questions 
for Kim specifically? There's a hand online. Oh, there's a hand. Uh, Bruce? Uh, so you very briefly mentioned signal displays, but you didn't really talk about them. And I know Mathieu's not part of the team in DSP anymore. Uh, is signal display still something that DSP is responsible for? I'll get back to you on that, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> awkward questions. Uh, yeah, that I mean, on a more serious note, that is something that we still need to properly figure out um, with the whole splitting of, of SDP. There's a lot of things we still need to figure out. So yeah, we'll get back to everyone who's interested in that soon. Uh, Roford, I think, had a hand up. Um, do you use any special hardware for, for all this processing? Yeah, I'm really not a hardware person, so I, I'm not very good at answering that. <laughs> I mean, for the calibration, we have uh, nodes with very high um, amounts of RAM because we buffer up all of those incoming visibilities. So those are sort of, I guess, custom amounts of RAM that we've specified. But otherwise, the rest of it is just like normal, you know, servers with GPUs and CPUs. It's not like a FPGA or special special purpose built things. Thank, thank, thank you very much. I just I want to to know. So we store all this data that comes in um, from the um, UV data um, in an image that's twelve terabytes. Um, and it's stored as well. But you were mentioning that all this data we've got, there's data that's also, there's nothing in it. So I want to know when do we actually discard the data? Or do we just keep it and for research later on? Yeah, so the model that we have at the moment is that the data stays on the, you know, in the live spinning disk archive for. 200 days, I was informed. I thought it was six months, but apparently it's slightly longer. And then it gets put onto tape and it lives in tape forever. We never delete it. No. Um, so yeah, we were basically keeping the stuff forever for potential use in the future. Um, the only tricky thing is that it's actually very difficult to get the images back off tape. That's still, you know, like TB, TBA, whatever. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Kim. Um, I see there is a note from Sarah in the chat that Mathieu will be talking about signal displays tomorrow. So I think signal displays have just followed Mathieu. Um, yes. And I believe in the SE group at the moment. Um, okay. uh, whoops, not nope, Zoom. Uh, okay, uh, this brings us to the final part. Oh, there's a question? Ah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, does it make any sense to compress? any of those data or is it not not really suitable the compression or takes long or to, not not really worth it um yeah i don't really know much about that so I, I can't really comment i think it is possible but it hasn't really been looked into and we didn't plan to compress them at the start so yeah and i can add that i mean it's gaussian data so it's it, it has a bit of compressibility but it's like pretty noisy you know like we're making i mean our signal is noise and the noise is noise so if you look at the data it's basically staring at the at the snow on a tv screen for for like 10 centuries that's basically it. yeah i think there was also a response um in the comments i'm not sure if yeah. you can see it here so i'll just read it out it also says it depends how well the data is calibrated on how much you can compress Okay, um, all right, we're now in the final part of our presentation. So thank you for sticking around this far. We're probably going to be a minute or two over time. So please just bear with us. Thanks for all the questions. Um, last but not least, um, we also just want to talk a little bit about research and development that our group has started doing. So obviously, we've built the Meerkat correlator and the Meerkat pipeline, and we're building the Meerkat extension correlator and pipeline. And when we built the new correlator for Meerkat extension, it was kind of a bit of R&D because we've moved from FPGA-based correlators to GPU-based and a lot of, um, as we sort of wrap up Meerkat extension development, a lot of our team is actually moving into this blue sky research R&D phase to figure out how do we build the next generation of correlators and pipelines for radio astronomy. So Andrew Martins is going to talk a little bit about one of the projects that we've started up um, this year for R&D. Thank you, Andrew.
Cool. Thanks, Ty. Try not to be too long. Um, so yeah, as Ty said, we sort of know how to build correlators. We've been doing it for a while. And I guess our team is looking at building better and better ones. So like looking into the future, there's going to be a, like higher and higher bandwidths. Uh, um, and obviously we're going to try to solve some of the issues. I know when we were thinking about Meerkat originally, there was this idea that we'd be continuously processing data and we kind of haven't quite got there yet. We kind of store it and then process it. We haven't got the full pipeline thing going, but hopefully in the next few years, we actually, you know, we'll get close to that. So there's some R&D looking at, at algorithms and things like that, Andrew and them are doing. And then one of the things we're looking at is also hardware um, that might help us uh, with this thing. So the thing we're looking at is um, something called the smart NIC. Um, so a traditional NIC uh, there on the left, um, data coming into your PC or whatever would use one of these. So the data would come in, typically it would get stored in, depending on the, uh, on the driver or whatever, it would get stored in a bit of uh, your system memory and interrupt would then uh, ask the processor to come and look at this data. The processor would come, decide what to do with the packet, probably copy it out into another part of memory. And then um, you eventually your application would sort of get this data. Um, the problem with that is that um, it uses the CPU a lot. It uses quite a lot of um, memory um, sort of accesses. And when you're streaming huge amounts of data um, and uh, yeah, different types of data, like your CPU just can't keep up. So recently they started looking at um, improving NICs to allow basically more data to come in and out of your, your processor. And they've got these things called smart NICs. And there's different levels of smart. So there's um, there's things that, that allow network offloading. So basically the idea is that you're moving some of those tasks away from the processor and into the actual NIC itself. So it, it takes away some of that work that the NIC's doing and maybe some of the memory accesses too. So stuff like responding to ping packets, say, like the processor doesn't have to go and look at a ping packet and decide it's a ping packet and then respond. You could have the NIC do that just by itself. Um, there's also stuff called, um, there's, there's stuff being done around DMA. So basically the idea is you can copy the data directly from your NIC into memory instead of having going via the kernel and via the operating system. Um, there's something called remote DMA. Um, there's sort of uh, various protocols and stuff being developed and tried out um, that allow you to almost, from your source PC, send it directly to a location in the remote sort of um, processor sort of space. Um, and then uh, the, the thing that I call the super uh, part of it is we're gonna look at actually possibly imp implementing um, uh, astronomical algorithms in the smart NIC. We're going to evaluate whether it makes sense to actually do astronomy things in the FPGA. Um, so on the right here is one of these um, smart NICs um, developed by AMD. Um, and uh, this one particularly has, a, has a, an ARM processor with 16 cores on it. And um, that allows you to do a lot of, lot of network offloading. So it, it can do, and it can do even custom stuff. You can write code that'll run on there that'll look at your packet format, say your custom packet format and do, do things with the, um, the packet for you. Um, so what we're gonna be doing um, is we're gonna do a, um, some research to find out whether it makes sense to use these things just in theory. Um, are there parts of the pipeline which make sense to actually do, say, an FPGA, do this uh, su sort of super part of it, um, um, and look at different types of commercial off-the-shelf NICs. There are smart NICs that, um, like the previous one, that you can sort of buy and just configure. Um, and then in parallel, we're actually going to be developing uh, some prototypes um, with some hardware we've already got. We've got these LVO boards. Um, and the idea is that we can hopefully um, uh, take one of these Alveo boards, uh, find a nice platform. These development platforms are out there for SmartNICs, and then hopefully add our own custom DSP um, and, and produce something useful. That's what we're hoping. Um, and that project we're hoping to be done sort of beginning of next year, have these some of these prototypes and have sort of hopefully at a first stab at deciding whether smart mix or something we want to be uh, using as part of our sort of data processing 
pipeline. Cool. Any questions? Cool. Cool. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right. Um, and that is it for the digital signal processing group. Um, are there any other questions? Um, we would show you the lab, but there's nothing very exciting besides a few flashing lights. Um, so if you want to see flashing lights, let us know. We can take you to our lab. Um, but most of you have probably already been there. Um, and yeah, otherwise, thank you very much for your time and thank you for all the questions.